so our first impression of Juliet Dorsey is, or Barbara Dorsey, the older sister, um, is kind of uh, we might view her in a sort of cold way. Uh, she seems to go through men quite quickly, um, and once they are wounded or um, again lose their sort of status in society, she drops them and moves on to the next one. So she goes through all these soldiers um, and she sort of idolizes them, adores them, and then uh, abandons them when they are no longer her version of the ideal uh, soldier. So she does this with uh, Captain Villiers, Jamie Villiers, uh, who Juliet Dorsey will go on to describe, um, but she's moved on to Taffler, it seems, right? So Taffler's her new man. And then we have this sort of uh, image, uh, imagery in regards to Captain Villiers, who is, uh, he can, he knows that Barbara is there, and um, she comes and visits with flowers but doesn't say anything, and then Captain Villiers is screaming in his bandages. And the other nurses are just view her as you know a horrible person for sort of teasing him in this way, and they have to uh, administer morphine when she's left. Uh, Captain Villiers, she says, has been trapped in fire and his vocal cords were destroyed as he swallowed the flames. Uh, so she, Juliet Doris, or but, um, I'm gonna get the names mixed up the whole time, but um, Barbara Dorsey. Uh, you know, uses men in this way, right? So she has dated Captain Villiers in the past. Now he's all in bandages and wounded. Uh, and then she's moved on now to Taffler, who is the pinnacle of sort of soldier masculinity at this point, right? He looks like a boy's own annual hero. And uh, she is now moved on. So she's somewhat of a sort of social climber or socialite and uh, would be uh, dating all the most handsome war heroes at the time. So uh, in chapter 12 of part 2 we learn more about the um, Dorsey family and uh, all of the siblings in that family. So in uh, the transcript of the interview with Lady uh, Julia Dorsey, she describes um, what it was like to grow up uh, during this time. Uh, at the time, she was only 12 years old, so very young, and she would have lived at St. Aubyn's, um, where all the soldiers would, the wounded soldiers would come to sort of heal themselves. Uh, there was just too many wounded, uh, so houses like private estates would be turned into convalescent homes or makeshift kind of military hospitals where uh, the soldiers could recover because there was just too many wounded soldiers, right? So uh, the hospitals could not support them. So this is where uh, St. Aubyn's is turned from a family home into a... Uh, refuge for the soldiers who are recuperating. And in this uh, description, Julia Dorsey talks about her sister, Barbara, and how she went through men. Um, and then the Dorsey family has uh, five siblings in total. So the youngest is Temple, and then there's Julia Dorsey, who's the one who we are um, introduced to. She's an old lady now. Uh, and she's being interviewed by our narrator, and then she's telling us all these stories about uh, Robert, who spent some time at St. Al Aubyn's. And then Barbara's the older sister, and then there were two brothers as well, Clive and uh, Clive. Clive, and then the other brother is uh, Michael. So uh, Barbara is sort of the older sister, and she uh, is described, so she's characterized as sort of adoring the brothers, uh, but very jealous too, and she has this kind of uh, way of attaching herself to all of her brother's friends and then dating them, and that's how she met uh, Jamie Villiers, who had become Captain Villiers, the man wrapped in the bandages. 
um, who she, as we can assume, has dated, and then now that he is incapacitated, uh, she has moved on. Um, and then Juliet Dorsey describes her sister. Uh, she says, for as long as I can remember, she had a taste for heroes and athletes. She enjoyed the spectacle of winning, but more than that, she made a sort of cult of exclusivity, letting people in and out of her life. She was like a club, but she wasn't a stob, snob, anything but. It was just that a wall went up if you didn't intrigue her. I think that was it. You had to intrigue her or you didn't exist. Uh, so she's somewhat of this sort of social person who has a kind of... Um, would have sort of associated with her older brothers and they all are soldiers and somewhat intellectuals. There's also a group of pacifists that Clive is uh, friends with and they all hang out at uh, St. Aubyn's. And then Barbara is somewhat of a complex woman, right? She cannot handle the death of her or the death or wounding of her uh, love interests, so she'll date these young men until the point where they are, again, um, uh, no longer on her pedestal, so she can't sort of um, glorify them or idolize them. And she's also very jealous, so she only dates sort of the the heroes of war, and she'll move on once you are wounded or uh, you no longer meet that ideal that she has in her mind. And that's how she moves on from uh, Jamie Villiers to Taffler. And in this part, we also have Juliet Dorsey talking about Robert and Harris, which is kind of interesting. So on page 101, we get a little bit her uh, sort of interpretation of that relationship. And she says... The thing you want to know about is Barbara meeting Robert and how it was that Robert brought about their ultimate relationship. These are the circles, all drawing inward to that thing that Robert did. You know I'm guessing at this, but I think that Robert was in love with Harris. Somewhat the same way Jamie had been in love with Clive. It may be pedestrian to say so, but the truth is often pedestrian, and I think the fact is that extremely physical men like Robert and Jamie and Taffler are often extremely sensitive men as well. Not your local football players, mind you. They're more apt to be maudlin and sentimental. But the true athletes, the ones who seek beauty through perfection, I think they seek out poets and artists, just as poets and artists seek them out. Maybe not always as lovers, though love has so many ways of expressing itself outside of the physical. I certainly don't want to paint a picture of a lot of poets and athletes lusting after one another's bodies, but love, yes. Robert, though he never said so, loved Harris. It was clear in the way he dealt with his death and in the way he spoke of him afterwards to me. The war was part of it too. You cannot know these things. You live when you live. Uh, so she is sort of suggesting that there are sort of bonds that go beyond just physical love. And uh, she's sort of saying this is a kind of love that elevates, that's elevated where you have a connection with somebody regardless of their uh, sex or gender, um, and they are, these are the bonds that sort of held together this generation of young people uh, as they were going through this horrendous experience. So she sees a similarity between uh, her brother Cl uh, Clive and then his friend Jamie, and then she sees the same bond between uh, Robert and Harris, that there was this kind of love that existed between men. Uh, so it's somewhat different than, um, she's not saying it was a sexual love, but she was saying it was a bond that was important to them and uh, made a difference in their lives and they were touched by this other person's presence in their life. And you can think of it um, in terms of if you, if all your friends and family were dying all around you and there was somebody there who uh, you connected with even for a moment um, that's how these young people sort of existed for one another. They were important bonds, even if they were temporary and fleeting.
Juliet Dorsey also describes uh, her sister as uh, cruel um, in her presence uh, at, at the way she sort of dates the men. Um, and she uses a allusion to Greek myth on page 102. Um, so she's describing Barbara uh, as being cruel. So Barbara standing at the foot of the bed someone else doing all the talking, Barbara with her flowers, her freesia, emanations, there they are on the mantle, and she was like that cold white vase and never said a word. She stood and watched them dying like a stone. Ariadne and Dionysus. Well, it's not a bad analogy, yes. Deserted by one god, she took up another. So there's lots of sort of uh, interesting wordplay being used. Um, so Barbara is cold, like a stone, right? This is another sort of reference to um, maybe Taffler and the stones as well. Uh, how cold and tough you had to be on the exterior in order to endure this moment. Um, and then the Greek myth Ariadne and Dionysus. Ariadne um, would have been... So in the myth... Uh, Ariadne was with, uh, she was supposedly helped the other god, Theseus, defeat the Minotaur, and then uh, she was, she moved on to Dionysus, which is another god. So that's sort of the reference that Juliet Dorsey is making of Barbara in the way that she sort of idealized these war heroes and then moved on from one to another once they stopped being like heroic or godlike figures to her. So she put them all up on a pedestal, and then when they uh, sort of crumbled or were destroyed by the war, she just moved on to the next one. And uh, she had this pattern again and again. She'd repeat it with all the men that she uh, was dating. So that was her way of coping with uh, the realities, the, the fact that, you know, all of the loved ones that she had are uh, dying all around her. So she used this sort of this romantic... Uh, her sexuality or whatever was tied to um, her way of coping with tragedy. Part three of the novel, uh, this is uh, taking place again on the battlefield and we learn some of the fates of the young men that we met um, in the previous uh, section. All of Robert's uh, acquaintances that he uh, got to know and bond with uh, at his dugout um, so we learn about um, Levitt. So uh, during this moment, um, there's described, you know, moments at their dugout would be uh, peaceful for some parts, and then uh, other times they would be, you know, completely uh, in midst of chaos. Um, so there's a famous quote uh, in regards to... Uh, how soldiers spent their time, and it is uh, one of the soldiers wrote a letter home and then said that life in the trenches was summed up by the phrase, uh, months of boredom punctuated by moments of extreme terror. So that's sort of what we get in this uh, chapter where uh, this is a moment of terror where uh, they're getting shelled and their dugout is pretty much destroyed and they believe that uh, one of their men is buried alive in the mud and they are trying to dig him out. Levitt, who we've learned previously, was the one who, who carried books with him all the time, right? So he was very practical and rational in the extreme and um, he was a follower of this Clauschwitz, uh, this general who wrote books about war and he was trying to hold on to his books while all around him is just uh, chaos. And then Levitt suffers from a kind of um, shock, right? So he could be seen as having uh, shell shock. And then he goes, uh, he ends up being taken away. He's, again, when faced with the chaos of war, he can't quite uh, rationalize it, and uh, he kind of loses it a little bit. So we see this breakdown of his character on page 112. So this is Levitt meeting his breaking point. 
and he's trying to keep everything in order and it's become, you know, everybody else recognizes that they're